morning and welcome to Life Bible Fellowship Church this morning. I'm so thankful that you're here this morning. And today's Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, it doesn't always happen on a Sunday, but um, certainly if you have somebody at home that is in your life, um, that is meaningful to you, our hope today is that you express that to them. Hey, God loves us and we are meant to love our neighbors and love the people around us. So it's always a great day to remind people that they are important to us in our lives. So once again, happy Valentine's Day and welcome to church this morning. If you're new to Life Bible Fellowship Church today, we're so thankful that you found Life Bible Fellowship Church. LBF Church exists to passionately pursue life in Jesus and then help to lead our neighbors to do the same. That is why we're here. So our hope is that today in this service, in the Bible studies, men's and women's, the life groups, and all the different programs and events that we might have, that you will see that this church is pointed straight at Jesus. That's who we want to be. And so within this service, we're gonna worship, we're gonna grow in God's word, and we're gonna figure out, better figure out as a community, how we can honor and glorify God through our lives. That is why we're here. And part of that is sort of a neat announcement I have for you is that this coming Wednesday, that's February 17th at 6.30 p.m., right here on the LBF campus, um, we're having our Ash Wednesday service. Again, that's Wednesday, February 17th at 6.30 p.m., live underneath the tent. Now, unfortunately, it's not gonna be uh, recorded. Uh, we're not gonna have a, a, a service on YouTube for Ash Wednesday. It'll just be a live uh, service, but it's a very important service. And our hope is that you, your family and your friends, uh, anyone you can invite can make it there to that Ash Wednesday service. If you remember from the past, it's a very meaningful service because it's a time where we take and we prepare our hearts, we prepare our minds, we pray, we worship together, and we prepare ourselves for that season of Lent to invite God into our hearts as we prepare for his death and then his ultimate resurrection and that celebration because he was raised from the dead on that third day and claimed the victory. We're gonna celebrate Easter and really Ash Wednesday is that, is that start of that time. So our hope is, is that you can be there on February 17th, Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. live underneath the tent here on the LBF campus. So with all that, it is time to worship. Lord Jesus, you are worthy and we worship you this morning. Come meet us here. Rumors of the Son of Man. Stories of the Savior. Holiness with human hands. Treasure for the tree.
ransom, my savior, my refuge, my hiding place. You're my helper, my healer, my blessed redeemer, my answer, my saving grace. You're my hope in the shadows, my strength in the Great. 
God like you A love so true There has never been There will never be A God like you A love so true There has never been There will never be A God like you And you came to my rescue and I 
trust in you. The name that is above all other names, the name of Jesus. The name that every tongue will confess and every knee will bow before. The name that makes the darkness flee and tremble. The name that the whole world rejoices at the sound of. Lord, we have confidence that when we call on your name, there's power and truth. So we proclaim the name of Jesus over our lives, over our circumstances, over our struggles, over our hurts. Lord, we proclaim it in our triumphs. And we trust on, on you this morning. We trust in, in your holy name. Jesus, we love you. Would you come and meet us here this morning? Well, this is a sad week for us here at LBF. This is actually Nick Antonelli's last Sunday on staff with us. Nick has served faithfully for the past four years in both the worship department and then recently in the young adult ministry. And the Lord has used you, Nick, in such a powerful way. And man, you are going to be really missed around here. But uh, maybe you can share a little bit about what the Lord is calling to you next. Yeah, so... Um me and my wife have just felt uh, just a call for a different stage of um, ministry life in, uh, in a way. And uh, we've been praying about it for a couple years. And um, the rough idea is just that it would revolve around us running 
um, just a coffee shop that we can minister out of to employees and also to the community around us. And uh, in order to do that, we just feel like we need to gain some knowledge and um, really dive in to the world um, of coffee and business. And, and so we're hoping that uh, God will be faithful in this next step and that we would just continue to trust him. Amen. Well, Nick, can I pray for you? Lord God, I thank you for Nick and I thank you for his heart for you and his heart for people. I pray that, Lord, you would use him in a powerful way. Lord, I pray that you would bless his family. Pray that you would bless he and Sarah's relationship. I thank you for how you have used him, um, both in my life and in the worship ministry here, God. Um, I just ask for a blessing over his family. Help him to trust you in this next season, to turn to you in ways that he never has before. Uh, we love you and we thank you that you are faithful and it is in your name, King Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. And we still may see Nick uh, from time to time here on the online service as he uh, plays some sweet licks and, and hopefully fills in the guitar for us. But uh, if you can join me in praying for Nick, that would be awesome. Well, hello and happy Valentine's Day to all of you. Uh, if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to grab it, open up to the book of 1 John towards the end of the New Testament as we continue in to our series through this great New Testament letter. I'm going to read our passage for this morning, and it's great if you have a Bible or if you use your phone for a Bible, it's great to have it open so that you can follow along. But the verses will be up here on the screen as I read them to begin our time together. And it's going to be 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. And I'll read those now. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, one which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. This is God's word. Well, let's pray together. Father, thank you for speaking through your word. Thank you most of all for the eternal word, for Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you guide us through this time. Speak to us. Guide me that my words will be helpful and true and accurate and timely. We pray that you move through the power of your spirit through this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So in 2016, there was a baseball game that was played between the Milwaukee Brewers and the Washington Nationals. For the Nationals, Max Scherzer was pitching. And if you follow baseball, you know Scherzer is one of the great pitchers of the last 25 years. Um, so he was on the mound, and uh, with two outs in the first inning, up came for the Milwaukee Brewers, Ryan Braun, one of their best hitters. Now, it, Ryan Braun has had a very successful career, but he had not been successful against Max Scherzer. In fact, he was 0 for 10 against him, had come up to bat 10 times against him, had never gotten a base hit. In fact, five of those 10 times that he'd hit against Scherzer, he had struck out. So you got to imagine, he went up to the plate thinking, all right, what do I need to do here? I need to zero and I need to do everything right in order to be successful this time, unlike all of the other times. And he finally was got up to the plate. You got to imagine he was talking to himself, all right, make sure that the mechanics are right. Make sure that the stance is right. Don't get over eager. Don't let him trick you with anything off speed. And with the two balls and one strike count, Ryan Braun laced a single straight up the middle. None of the defenders got close to it until it got to the outfield, ran to first base and he had a single. And you got to imagine he was congratulating himself saying, all right, I, I finally zoned in and did everything right and got a base hit off this guy. But a couple minutes later, after a short conference between the Nationals manager and the umpires, 
Braun was called out. And this was very strange because he certainly hadn't struck out. He had only one strike on him when he got the hit. And he hadn't had his base hit caught by anybody. It was clean up the middle. Um, he hadn't missed first base and he was standing on first base by the time the ball got back in. He had done everything right, so why was he out? He was out because he had batted out of order. You see at the beginning of every baseball game, the managers bring a lineup card to the umpires to show what their batting order is. And in the Brewers' batting order, Ryan Braun was meant to bat fourth. But he came on with two outs in the first inning as the third batter. And so he was automatically out. He had done everything right, but he was still out because if you bat out of order, it doesn't matter if you did everything else right. Now, here's the deal. We've been going through 1 John. And if you just look at the Bible as a whole, the Bible is a big book. There's a lot of stories in there. There's a lot of commands in there. There's a lot of practices that Christians are given. There's a lot of truths and realities that we're meant to embrace. But John in this passage is going to zero in on one reality that is meant to be at the center of our lives, and that's the reality of love. And in essence, what he's going to tell us is if we get love wrong, it doesn't matter what we get right. We're going to walk through these five verses. And as we do, the way that John is going to walk us through the reality of love in the lives of Christians is by answering two questions. The first question he's going to answer is, why does love matter? And the second question that he's going to answer is, what does love mean? Why does love matter? What does love mean? It seems appropriate on Valentine's Day. So let's dive in to the first question, which is why does love matter? Look at verse seven with me. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. The old command is the message you have heard. John says, I'm writing to you an old command. Nothing new, nothing revolutionary, nothing innovative, unlike the false teachers in John's day who kind of thrived on coming up with something that nobody had ever heard before. John says, I'm writing to you something old. In fact, it's something that you've had since the beginning because it came from Jesus. And he says, what I'm writing to you about is the message that you have heard. In other words, John is saying, I, I'm writing to you the same old, same old. I'm writing to you that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was sent because there is one true God out there, one true, good, gracious, creative, all-powerful God. And because we as human beings in our rebellion against God have made a mess of this entire world, and we're not just victims of the mess that we've made, but because of our rebellion, we stand before God as objects of wrath. We stand before the judgment of God. But God in his great love sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live the perfect life that we should have lived, to die a sacrificial death, a death that we deserved, and to be raised victorious from the dead so that the gates of eternal life swung open wide and we were invited to have eternal life and adoption into the family of God, forgiveness for all of our sins and a relationship with God. He's saying, it's the same old, same old. I'm writing you the same message. And just as a note, in 2021 at Life Bible Fellowship Church, um, we do not place innovation and originality when it comes to the message uh, as our top priorities. It is the same old, same old. Jesus passed along this message and we are looking to pass it along again. It was first spoken by the Lord Jesus. The apostles passed it along. We have it written in the Bible. We are not looking to innovate and come up with the newest, flashiest, most creative idea to put out there for all of you. I'm not looking to get up and tell you my newest thoughts about how we should live life. We are looking to communicate the gospel message that was passed down to us. John says, I'm writing to you, an old command. But then he really mixes things up in an odd way because look at the beginning of verse eight. He says, yet I'm writing you a new command. Now that's confusing. I'm writing you an old command and I'm writing you a new command. It's both old and new. Now, now here's the deal before we go any further because he's talking a lot about command, but he hasn't given us a command yet. Let's just get the cat out of the bag. 
we know the command that he's talking about because he makes it completely evident in verses nine through 11. The command that he's talking about is the command to love one another. That's what he's talking about here. The old and new command that he's referring to is the command to love one another. And so we got to ask the question, all right, why is that old and why is that new? Um, we'll, We'll start with the old. The reason the command to love one another is old is because it was spoken by Jesus. And John is writing this several years, several decades after Jesus came. He's passing along something that he'd already passed along to them. In fact, in John's gospel, he quotes Jesus. In John 13, 34, when Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. In the very next verse, he says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And you can bet that when John and others passed along the message of the gospel to these people, they included that statement by Jesus. So John says, I'm telling you something you should already know. I'm not making up something new. I'm, I'm telling you an old command. But he also says that this command is new. And so in what way is it new? In fact, if you were paying attention to the quote from John 13, you would notice that Jesus said it was new. In what way is it new? Well, John tells us in verse 8. He says, yet I'm writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you. Its truth, its realization, its, its fulfillment is seen in him, in Jesus, and in you, his church, his people. And then he says, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Here's the reason why the command is new. Because Jesus, the light of the world, has come into the darkness. And now Jesus, the eternal son of God, is the perfection of love, the realization of what love is. If we want to understand what love is, we look at Jesus and we see the shining light of love. And not only that, but now when we look at the church of Jesus, his people, those who belong to Jesus, when we love one another, the world is able to see the realization of love. That's the newness of all of this. It's an old command, but it's also a new command in that sense. And I want you to notice something in this. I I mentioned earlier, man, man, there's all kinds of commands in the Bible. In fact, just last week, Pastor Gary brought us through the, the passage right before this, where John talks about the idea that part of how we know we belong to God is that we obey his commands. But here he switches from commands to command. When he's talking about love, this is really important for us to realize. When he's talking about love, love is not one command. Love is the command. John seems to be saying here that love is so important because love is the core command. Love is the command out of which every other command flows. And in case you think that this would have been a a strange or or hard to prove statement by John, um, he's saying something that Jesus already told us. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then in verse 40, listen to what he says. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Every other command in the Bible, everything else in the Bible hangs on these two commands, love God and love one another. And really, as you read the rest of the New Testament, these two commands get melded into one command. They're, They're interchangeable because one of the key ways that we show our love for God is by loving one another. And we can't love one another without loving God. So these two commands are really one command. John emphasizes this. The Apostle Paul emphasizes this. In fact, listen to what the Apostle Paul said about love in the great love chapter. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, 
I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. John makes it really clear here that if we get love wrong, we don't get anything right. If we get love wrong, it doesn't matter what we get right. Because Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 says, man, I can give everything away. I can speak with great prophetic gifts. I can use my gifts to build up. I can do any of that if I don't have love. None of it matters. In the end, what John is saying is that Christian morality is pretty simple. It doesn't mean it's easy, but it's, it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. Love is what we're called to do. And the reason we don't commit adultery is because that's not the way that you love your wife or that other person. The reason that we don't commit murder or acts of violence is because we're called to love. The reason we don't steal, the reason that we don't lie, the reason that we don't gossip, any of these many things, the reason we don't do these things is because love is not just a command. Love is the core command. Love is the command out of which everything else flows. And so even as we think of us as a church, we, we are meant to live in the reality of loving the world and especially of loving one another. So, so here's the deal. Just listen to this. If we get everything else right, if we get the doctrine of salvation right, and we make sure that we proclaim that we are saved not by works, but by faith, but we get it wrong with love, it doesn't matter. If we get masculinity and femininity right in a world where we're deeply confused about these things and, and we've even denied the idea that there's something distinctive about a man or something distinctive about, about a woman and we hold to God's truth firmly in this against cultural pressure, but we get it wrong with love, it just doesn't matter. If we get it right with abortion and the sanctity of human life and the evil of abortion and the, the beauty and preciousness of every other human being, but we get it wrong with love, we get it wrong. And if we reject the heresy of prosperity theology, but we get it wrong with love, it just doesn't matter. If you get love wrong, it doesn't matter what you get right because love is not just a command. Love is the command. It is the center of our calling as believers in Jesus. But there might be a danger. So some of you might be feeling this danger right now where you're saying, no, 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 no. If we, if we just tell everyone, don't worry about anything else, just love, we're gonna have sort of this gooey, very soft, very cowardly version of Christianity. Nobody's ever gonna speak truth. Nobody's ever gonna confront one another because we're just gonna have to say, no, no, just love each other. Um, and that would be true if we had a faulty definition of love. And so this next section we're gonna go through is very important when John moves from the question, why does love matter, to the question of what does love mean? Because if we get the definition of love wrong, it's not gonna matter whether or not we emphasize it. So John moves from why does love matter to what does love mean? Now let's walk through these verses first. Starting in verse nine, he says, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. And by contrast, verse 10, anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. Uh, the, the subtitle that we have for this series through 1 John is, that's how you know. And once again, John is bringing out that reality. The way that we recognize those who are having fellowship with God, the way that we recognize those who belong to God is that they walk in the light and love their brothers and sisters. If you're saying, oh yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm walking in the light. I'm walking in close fellowship with God. I belong to God. But you're hating a brother or a sister. You're walking in the darkness. And one of the powerful things just about what John is bringing out in these two verses is he talks about love and hate and the fact that hate and love are, are both causes and results. Um, and what I mean is this, when you live by hate, you choose to walk in the darkness. Walking in hate is what leads you into the darkness. And at the same time, the reason why you walk in hate is because you're in the darkness. And the same with love. 
It, it is a cause of us walking in the light in the sense that we're saying, I'm gonna choose to obey God in this challenging way of loving other people, sometimes people that are not that easy to love. I'm gonna make the choice and that is going to lead me to walk in his light, to walk in close fellowship with him. And at the same time, we know that love is a fruit of the spirit. It's a result of walking in the light and walking in the empowering that God gives. Hate and love are both results and causes of walking in the light or in the darkness. And then look at how he caps it off in verse 11. He says, but anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness, they do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. And this is in contrast to verse 10, where he says the person who walks in the light has no cause for stumbling in them. They have no reason to trip over anything because they can see clearly, the lights are on. But the person roaming around in the darkness is blinded by their hate. And Part of what John is bringing out to us is that love illuminates, hate blinds. When we hate others, it blinds us. Some some of us even know this. You, You know what it's like when you despise another person and you can just be blinded to the reality of life, blinded to what God is saying, and certainly blinded to that person's value. Whereas when we're walking in love, we're seeing things more clearly. We're seeing things through God's eyes. But probably the strangest thing about these verses is that John seems to set up a binary. He seems to say, you're either going to love others or you're going to hate others. And most of us hear that and we think, it seems like there's a lot in between there. It seems like there's a lot in between love and hate. Um, it, It seems like you would get a lot of indifference or mild frustration or slight affection or or things like that. It seems strange to say that we're having to choose between only two options, and those two options are love and hate. And the reason why this seems strange to us is that we have faulty definitions of both. We have faulty definitions of both hate and love. Um, In short, our definition of hate is too sharp, and our definition of love is too soft. Or another way of putting it is this. We are too quick to say that we love others and we're too slow to say that we hate others. Um, This whole idea of love and hate boils down to the idea that when we're choosing between love and hate, we're we're either going to choose something or we're going to reject it. That seems to be the biblical idea behind this. When we think of hate in 21st century United States, we usually think of hate as I'm actively against this person. I'm trying to thwart them. I'm trying to harm them. I have malice towards them in my heart. Um, And in the biblical idea that that's not quite what's going on. To love is to choose to give your loyalty to something or someone, and to hate is to reject giving your loyalty to someone or something. Jesus brings this out in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, where, when he says, you cannot serve two masters because you'll love the one and you'll hate the other, which we want to respond to that and say, well, well no, 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 I, w- I would just choose the one and just disregard the other. And Jesus would respond by saying, yeah, that's what I said. You'd love the one and you'd hate the other because to disregard in the biblical understanding is to hate. You're choosing one and you're rejecting the other. We are too slow to admit that we hate because we only categorize hate for ourselves when we have active malice towards a person. But biblically, we'd ha- we would have to admit hate if there's anybody that we're looking at and we're disregarding to the point of saying, that person is unimportant to me. Um, you even think of Jesus' great parable of the Good Samaritan. Um, most of you are, are at least familiar with the idea. This guy gets beat up and left for dead by the roadside, and both a priest and a Levite pass by and don't help him at all. And very few of us today would read that and say, well, they didn't help him because they hate him. We would just say they didn't help him because he wasn't that important to them. And Jesus would say, yeah, that's hate. That's what hate is. That's what John is talking about. That's what Jesus is talking about. So we have to be real with ourselves and recognize that we are much too slow to admit hate in our hearts. Most of us would say, I don't hate everyone, anyone. And most of us might even say, I love everyone. But what John is forcing us to do in this passage is he's forcing us to ask ourselves the question, who is so unimportant to me that I'm unwilling to sacrifice for them? 
Who is so unimportant to me that I just disregard them? Maybe I am not actively rooting for their demise or for their doom, but they're so utterly unimportant, I'm not giving them a second thought. Um, For some of us, we'd have to admit, maybe there's a specific person coming to mind. Somebody in your family or somebody that you work with or go to school with, and you're thinking, yeah, that, that person fits that definition, that they are just so unimportant to me, I wouldn't be willing to sacrifice anything for them. Um, For some of us, we might have to think about groups of people and say, yeah, there's some groups of people who are just unimportant to me. I wouldn't be willing to do anything for them, Um, either because of their race or because of their age or maybe even more in our culture because of their political affiliation. I'm not willing to say a kind word. I'm not willing to give a glass of water. I'm not willing to give the benefit of of the doubt to these people because they are on the wrong side of the political divide. Who is so unimportant to you that you're unwilling to sacrifice for them? And when you've identified who that person is, that's the person that you hate. We have a faulty definition of hate, but the fact is we also have a faulty definition of love because we tend to think of love as just a warm feeling that we have towards someone. And so here's what I want to do. And this is really important. I want to walk through four statements about love that will help us understand what John is talking about in this high calling of love. Four things I want to say about love. Number one is this. Love is from God. In fact, that's something that John is going to tell us when we get to chapter 4 of this same letter. Listen to John chapter 4, verse 19. We love because he first loved us. And don't make a mistake. John is not there saying we love God because God first loved us. John is saying, we love others because God first loved us. We are capable of love to the extent that we are connected to God. In the words of John 15, we are abiding in the vine. We are connected to the vine. Therefore, we are experiencing God's power in our lives that empowers us to love. The only reason any human being can show love is because as human beings created in the image of God, we we bear some connection to him. And the only way we can truly live lifelong, sacrificial, loving lives is if we're connected in a very real, ongoing way to God. So so step one is just to say that the thing we need to know about love is that love is from God. It's not something you just conjure up in yourself. We are bad love factories in and of ourselves. We, We need to be connected to the source of love. So the first thing we need to know about love is that love is from God. The second thing we need to know about love is that love is something you decide to do. Now, it's it's qualified by number one that you don't just decide to do it in your own strength. You will fail at that. But what I mean by it's something that you decide to do is that it's not just something that you are left at the mercy of your feelings. Um, You'll have married couples who decide to split up, and sometimes what they'll say is, we just don't love each other anymore. Um, That statement would have been totally incoherent to John here. We said, what are, you, what are you talking about? Love is something that you decide to do. If what you mean is we don't have warm affection for each other anymore, all right, that, that absolutely can happen. And, and that can be very, very hard to work through. But you certainly can decide to love someone even if you don't still have warm affection for them springing up naturally in your heart. Love is something you decide to do. Love is something that we're called to do. Let us never say, I can't do anything about it. I just don't love them. Love is something that you decide to do. So number one, love is from God. Number two, love is something that you decide to do. Number three, love is sacrificing for the other person's good. And that's what you decide to do in the power of God and in the power of the Holy Spirit. You love somebody else by deciding to sacrifice for their good. And you can do that even if all of the feelings and emotions towards that person are absent. You can make the decision to say, I'm going to set myself aside and sacrifice for this person's good. Some of you are familiar with 1 Corinthians 13, you know, the love chapter, and sometimes it's read and quoted at weddings, you know, love is patient, love is kind, it's not rude, it doesn't boast, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Just, just think of some of those things in there. They, they all relate to sacrifice. Love is patient. You know what patience is? Patience is when you sacrifice your time in order to help or listen to someone else. 
Love is patient. Love is also kind. You know what that means? Being kind means you sacrifice your preferences in order to show concern for somebody else's preferences. Um, love does not boast. You know what that means? That means you sacrifice the spotlight by letting the spotlight be on somebody else, even if you think you're more deserving than they are of that spotlight. Love keeps no record of wrongs, which means love forgives. And you know what you're doing when you're forgiving? You are sacrificing your right or your impulse towards revenge and towards getting even. You're sacrificing that in order to show grace and forgiveness to somebody who, frankly, doesn't deserve it. Love is sacrifice. Love is from God. We're not going to be able to do this just in our own strength. Love is something you decide to do. Never say that you can't because it's a choice that you make. And that choice that you make is sacrificing for the good of the other person. And finally, number four, and this one is really important. Love is willing to wound. And what I mean is this, um, real love is, willing, is, is a willingness to temporarily hurt somebody else if that's what needs to happen for their ultimate good. Um, you can go to Proverbs where it talks about the idea that wounds from a friend can be trusted, but the kisses of the enemy are multiplied. Flattery is multiplied. Um, sometimes you'll talk to a parent. In fact, some of you parents may have said this. You may have said, I, I can't discipline my child because I just love them too much. Um, no, that's not true. Um, if you're not disciplining your children, the reason that you're not disciplining your children is not because you love them too much. It's because you love you too much. Um, and that may sound harsh, but it's a reality that we desperately need to come to grips with. When we as parents choose not to discipline our children, it's not because we love them. It's because we can't bear their disapproval. We can't bear the fact that they're going to be upset with us. And we're so deeply uncomfortable with it that instead of doing something that would be for their ultimate good, for the building of their character, we end up neglecting that so that we can be more comfortable. When you discipline your children, you don't set aside love to discipline them. You discipline them because you love them, because love is willing to wound. And man, in our culture today, we, we certainly are told over and over again that, that the idea for us as Christians, the idea that we would go to anybody else, a neighbor, a family member, a, a friend, another nation, and that we would say, you are lost and in sin and you are under judgment without Jesus. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We would be told that is absolutely unloving. How dare you tell somebody else that they're in sin and that they're headed for judgment? But that is the most loving thing that you can do for somebody who's in sin and is under judgment is that you can warn them so that they can turn and experience the grace and love of Jesus Christ. In the same way, we would be told in our culture, it is unloving for any of us as Christians to go to a fellow Christian and say, hey, you're in sin. You need to cut this out. You need to repent. You need to stop this unhealthy relationship. You need to stop saying these things. You need to stop posting these things. You need to stop sleeping with him. You need to stop sleeping with her. You need to stop this. We would be told that's unloving, but that's actually one of the most profoundly loving things that we can do. That's wounds from a friend. That's risking the discomfort of having somebody you care about upset with you because they are that important to you. That is real sacrifice. And that's something that all of us as believers need to be willing to do, whether it's for our children, whether it's for our spouses, whether it's for our brothers and sisters in Christ, whether it's for the world. Love is from God. Love is something you decide to do. Love is sacrificing for the good of the other person. And love is willing to wound others. And even as we take all this in, here, here's what I want to invite you to do now. Um, the, there's something that John said back in verse 8 that I talked about. It's, it's really striking. He says that this old and new command, which is the command to love one another, this whole idea of love, um, he says it's truth is seen in him and in you. The him is Jesus. And what John is saying when he makes that statement is all of this discussion that we're happen, having about love, making sure we get the definition right, making sure that we see its importance rightly, all this discussion that we're having about love, 
should center on Jesus because love is perfected in Jesus. Its truth is seen in him. Jesus displayed perfect love. In fact, John is going to say later on in this letter, God is love. Love is perfected in Jesus because far from hating us, Jesus saw us in our distress and he didn't disregard us. He didn't say, not my monkeys, not my problem. I don't have to deal with that. They got themselves into their own mess. Instead of disregarding us, he chose to save us. He chose to sacrifice. He chose to sacrifice through his perfect sinless life. He chose to sacrifice through his brutal death. He loved us, catch this, even when we were really, really difficult to love, even when we weren't lovely at all, even when we were rebels and difficult and constantly disobedient. He loved us even when we were really difficult. He sacrificed for us all. And catch this also, in an ongoing way, Jesus still loves us by being such a good savior that he's even willing to wound us through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He's willing to wave the flag when we're in the wrong and when we're walking in darkness and when we're gonna stumble and when we're gonna hurt others. Jesus is the perfection of love. So even when we talk about this, we gaze at Jesus. Love is at the center of Christian morality. Jesus is obviously at the center of everything for us as Christians. You want to know what love is? Look at Jesus. And for for some of us, we've just recently got through reading through the gospel of Luke and it was so rich reading through it and seeing Jesus, seeing the way that he's willing to sacrifice for others, seeing the way that he's willing to, to risk difficulty for himself, to risk imprisonment or risk the bad opinion of others, that he's even willing to risk having his own disciples wounded if that's what it takes to lead them to the truth and to lead them to freedom and joy. Love is perfected in Jesus. But remember, John said it's truth. The truth of love is seen in him and in you. And here's what that means. The way that Jesus shows the world his love is through the church. And again, by the church, I don't mean the building. By the church, I mean his people. Those who are welcomed into his family. Those who belong to him, who are saved by his great grace. That's how Jesus shows the world his love, through the way that we love one another and the way that we love our neighbor. And so when we're talking about this, this is pretty important. This matters a lot. The reason the world is going to see the love of Jesus is if we live in love for one another. So I have two questions um, for us to ask ourselves as we take this in. The first question is, who do you hate? And again, before you just go right ahead and say, I don't hate anyone, Pause long enough to ask yourself the question, um, who is so unimportant to me that I'm just not willing to lift a finger to help them? For some of you, as we've been talking about this, it might be some very specific people in your life that you're realizing, yeah, they fit that definition. Or it might be certain categories of people. And as you identify who it is that you hate, the invitation is to repent. Repent. The call is to repent, to come before God. He already knows what's going on in your heart. To come before God and admit this, and then also to beg for help. We are not love factories. We're not able to change ourselves in this area. We have to beg God, God, help me to love this other person. Help me to see your image in this other person. Help me to see the deep value that you place upon this other person. To repent and ask for help as we ask the question, who do you hate? And the second question we all need to ask is, how is your love? This is not just a command. This is the command. So how is your love? And if we're going to live in increasing love towards the people that God is calling us to love, we've got to respond to the reality of what love is. First of all, we've got to abide in the vine. We've got to be reading God's word. We've got to be drawing near to him in prayer. We've got to be pouring out our hearts to him because God is the source of love. And not only that, we've got to make the choice. We've got to say it's not about how I feel. It's about what God is calling me to do. And so I'm making the choice to sacrifice for others. And to begin to look around and say, what does that mean to sacrifice? That probably means listening. That probably means being willing to give. That probably means I sacrifice my anger and I don't vent at this person after what they did to me. That means instead I forgive them. To be willing to make the choice to sacrifice for them. 
And not only to be willing to sacrifice for them in those ways, but to be willing to sacrifice for them in a very real way that you're willing to wound people that you care about in the hopes that that will be for their ultimate good. And above all this, here's the reminder I want to give us. As we walk in love, we walk in the light. When we walk in the light, we walk in closeness with God. And when we walk in closeness with God, we are walking in closeness with the one who is love himself. This call that we're given to love is not something that's really good for other people, but kind of a drag for us. It is us walking in closeness with the one who has loved us so profoundly. And none of us crave for anything more significantly than to be known and to be loved. When we walk in love, we're walking with God. And when we walk with God, we're walking with the one who is love. Let me pray for us to that end. Father, thank you so much for the grace that you've poured out in Jesus. Thank you for the love that you've shown towards us when we are so undeserving, when we're not beautiful, when we're not lovely, when we're not easy, when we're not obedient. Thank you for the deep love that you've shown towards us. We pray that the love of Jesus will be shown in our lives. We pray that you lead us to repentance of our hate And we pray that you lead us to pour out love and sacrifice in such a way that the world will see Jesus in our midst. We pray this in the name of our great Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful rest of your week. 